in one of the previous videos, that one, we explored Kubernetes workload APIs. We saw the difference between pods, replica sets, jobs, deployments, stateful sets, daemon sets, and cron jobs. When I asked whether it would be interesting to explore another set of Kubernetes APIs, you overwhelmed me with responses that all say, yes, do more. So today we will continue where we left. We will explore Kubernetes service APIs. We'll see what services are and what the differences are between cluster API, node port and load balancer types. From there on, we will explore ingress and gateway API. We'll see what is the purpose of each, when each of them should or should not be used, and quite a few other things. Those should give you a pretty good understanding of Kubernetes networking, at least on the basic level from which you might want to jump into more advanced APIs, like those associated with uh, a service mesh, for example. So buckle up, we are about to dive into all Kubernetes service and network APIs. Containers in Kubernetes are wrapped inside pods. Each pod gets an IP assigned to it, and that means that we can use that IP to communicate with a specific pod. Let me show you what I mean by that, by listing pods inside one of my namespaces. There are two pods, and if we output them as YAML, we can see the IP assigned to it. That is very similar to how servers and virtual machines work. Back in the days, when we were deploying applications directly to servers, we would use their IPs to communicate with processes inside it. If application A would need to talk to application B running in a different server, we would instruct it to talk to the IP of that server. Easy, right? Well, that was never a great idea, but it wasn't a horrible one either. You see, back in those days, virtual machines and especially servers were relatively static. That server where an application is running is likely going to continue existing for a while. That IP will be the endpoint for that application until that server eventually dies. We were placing our bets that it would never die. It would live forever. In the meantime, we got tools that could do service discovery. So that application A would be able to talk to the application B simply by knowing its name. Service discovery would figure out where it is and how to translate that name into one or more IPs. If the server goes down and we move the application to a different one, service discovery would figure it out and start forwarding requests to that new server. The lesson learned is that we should never, ever, 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 ever use IPs directly, but instead rely on service discovery to figure out what is where. That's why those IPs assigned to those pods are useless as a way of direct communication. Pods are created and destroyed all the time. They're moved from one node to another. They're scaled up and down. Pods are not static. They're changing all the time. Hence, whichever IP is assigned to a pod is likely to become invalid pretty soon. We need something more. We need some sort of a service discovery. And that's what Kubernetes services are for. There are a few types of services and we'll start with the least capable one. Let's take a look at a service type cluster IP. This is a relatively simple definition of a service. It has a list of ports with only one entry. It uses TCP protocol to receive requests on the port 8080 and forward them to the target port, also 8080. It assumes that one of the processes in a container is listening to that port. Further on, we have the selector, which in this case, points to the name label set to silly demo. That means that requests will be forwarded to all the pods with that label running in the same namespace. Now, the last entry is important. It has the type set to cluster IP. That means that only other pods in the same cluster will be able to use that service to communicate with matching pods. We will not, and I repeat, not, be able to use it for traffic coming from outside the cluster. None of our users will be able to access those pods directly. It is meant to serve only and exclusively internal users, which are probably other pods. Now, let's apply that manifest and list all the services. For now, remember that the name of the service is Silly Demo and that it is associated with some pods. The external IP is set to none, meaning that it is not accessible from outside the cluster. And here comes the question. 
how can we use it to communicate to those pods from inside the same cluster? And the answer to that question is simple. We just need to know the name of the service and sometimes also the namespace where it is running. Let me demonstrate that by creating another pod inside the same namespace. This is a pretty dumb pod that has a container that is incapable of doing anything but sending requests through CURL. That's all we need. We'll send five requests to the application silly demo. The first will calculate Fibonacci number five, the second will go with number 10, then goes the third, the fourth and the fifth. The important note here is that all those requests were sent to a non-existing domain silly demo that happens to be the name of the service we apply. We have no idea where the pods are, how many of them there are, or anything else. All we need is the name of the service and the port. Given that all the requests received responses, it is clear that those requests somehow reached at least one of those pods. And the question is, which one processed those requests? Now, let's exit the temporary pod and list all the pods left in that namespace. We can deduce which of those two pods received those requests by taking a look at the logs. Let's take a look at the logs from one of those pods and filter them by the word Fibonacci. We can see that only some of those five requests reached that pod, meaning that the rest went to the other one. So here's what happened. A service is associated with a number of pods. That number can be zero or one or two or three or any other number. Most of the time, those are different replicas of the same application. Technically, it could be even pods of different applications, but that would not make much sense, so I will ignore that scenario. So, there is a service associated with the number of replicas of an application. Since that service type is set to cluster IP, it can receive requests only and exclusively from inside the cluster. Today, that is a different pod. So, a pod sends a request to the service, which forwards it to one of the replicas associated with it. Internally, a DNS that equals to the name of the service is created for each service. So that request did not need to know anything but the name of the service. The service, on the other hand, knows the IPs of all the associated pods and it uses round robin algorithm, which can be described as distribute requests evenly across all applications. That would be probably the closest description of it. So if there are three target pods and we send 300 requests to the service, each of those pods will receive approximately, more or less, 100 requests. Now, let's try to do the same but for a different namespace. So, start a pod with a container based on the CURL image and send the request to silly demo. That failed. Miserably. Here's the thing. A service or any other resource type must have a unique name within a namespace. We cannot have two silly demo services in the same namespace. What we can have are two silly demo services in different namespaces. So Kubernetes assumes that if we reference a service with only its name, that service is in the same namespace as the pod trying to communicate with it. The CURL pod we just used was running in the B team namespace, while the service it tried to talk to is in the A team namespace. To overcome that, we need to add the namespace to the address we are trying to talk to. So, we can construct the URL by specifying the name of the service as a subdomain of the namespace. And look at that, that worked! Yay! Now, let's exit the CURL pod and explore a different type of services. Let's take a look at the variation of the service we explored earlier. This time, the type of the service is node port. That means that it will be available outside of the cluster. A port will be opened on all nodes of the cluster, so we should be able to send a request to any node, any VM of the cluster, and that request will find its way to one of the pods associated with the service, no matter where the pods are. Now, if the only change would be the type of the service, Kubernetes would expose it to the outside world by assigning it to a random port, and we would need to discover which port was assigned. As an alternative, we can specify which port will be opened on all nodes of the cluster by specifying node port to be, in this case, 30,000. Bear in mind that specifying a specific node port is not, and I repeat, not a good idea. 
If another service would expose itself through the same port, we would have a conflict. If we have to expose services like that, we are better off letting Kubernetes expose them through a random port. We will see that in action later. For now, we hard coded, I hard coded the port 30,000 mostly for simplicity reasons and not as something I, I recommend you to do. Now let's apply the change to the service and retrieve all the services from that namespace. We can see that this time the port 8080 is now exposed through the port 30,000. To confirm that node port indeed means what I said it does, first we will find an IP of one of the nodes of the cluster. It can be any, so we'll use the first one. The external IP is the one we are looking for. That's the IP of one of the worker nodes of the cluster. So let's send a request to the external IP of one of the nodes and the port we chose to expose. And look at that, that worked. We got a response from one of the pods associated with the service. So here's what we did and what happened. We have a service associated with the number of pods. The service type is set to node port, meaning that it exposes a port, in this case 30,000, on every single node of the cluster. We sent a request to one of the nodes of the cluster. The service picked that request and forwarded it to one of the pods associated with it. That pod could be running physically on any of the nodes. The pod responded and that response eventually got back to us. An important note here is that services set to be type node port inherit all, and I repeat, all the features of cluster IP services. So we can still have pods inside the cluster communicating with the pods associated with that service in the same way as before. And here's another important note. If you're using a managed Kubernetes in cloud, like for example, Google GKE or AWS EKS or Azure AKS, you might never, and I repeat, never use node port services, at least not in the form we just explained. We'll use something better. That being said, let's remove the service we just applied and see what that something, something better is. The problem with node port services is that it is silly to rely on sending requests directly to a specific node of a cluster. That would fail the moment that node stops working, be it because it went down due to some unexpected event or it was upgraded or any other reason. A much better solution would be to have some sort of a proxy or a load balancer that would always contain an up-to-date list of nodes and forward requests to whichever is healthy. The problem is that such a solution might be challenging to build on our own. Luckily, we don't have to build anything like that ourselves. Kubernetes already has that capability and all we have to do is change the service to load balancer. Let's take a look at an example. This is almost the same definition as the first one we saw, except that the type is now set to load balancer. Just as node port services inherit all the features of cluster IP and add the ability to expose a port on all the nodes, load balancer services inherit everything node port services do, and then some. That means that the load balancer services also open ports on all the nodes. However, since in this case, we did not specify the node port, that port will be auto-generated. On top of doing all the same things as node port, load balancer services also create external load balancers and configure them to talk to whichever ports are exposed. Now, let's apply that definition and retrieve the services in that namespace. As expected, the service mapped a port on a node to the port the process is in containers listened to. That's not new. The external IP being in the pending mode or state is what is new. Right now, the service instructed the provider, in this case Google Cloud, to create a new load balancer. Once the load balancer is created, it will configure it to listen to the port 8080 and forward request to the service through the node port. From there on, the service itself will forward request to associated ports. So let's wait for a moment and retrieve the services again. We can see that the IP now contains an address. That's the IP of the load balancer which we could use to configure a DNS, a domain, so that requests sent to it are redirected to the load balancer. In turn, load balancer contains the list of the IPs of all the healthy nodes. If a node goes down, its IP will be removed from the list load balancer is using to forward requests. And here's a proof. I will copy the external IP, the one of the load balancer, and use it to send 
a request. We can see that we got the usual response from one of the pods. It worked and we did not need to resolve to using IP of any specific node of the cluster. So here's what we did and what happened. We created a load balancer service, which in turn instructed the provider to create an external load balancer, which always, always, always has up-to-date information about worker nodes of the cluster. If a node goes down, that node will be removed from the list, so requests sent to the load balancer will always be forwarded to one of the healthy nodes. That load balancer was automatically configured to accept requests on port 8080 and forward them to whichever auto-generated port was exposed on all nodes of the cluster. Once those requests enter nodes, the service itself redirects them to associated pods. Now, you may think, that's it. That's how we expose our applications to outside world, right? Well, no, 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 not so fast. Stop, stop. Having load balancer services alone would mean that we would need a service for each application and that would produce too many load balancers and it would cause us to go crazy, crazy when configuring DNSs. We need more. We need uh, ingress controllers. Before we start exploring Ingress, we'll go back to the beginning with our service. As a reminder, this is what we started with. It is a cluster IP service and all, and I repeat, all the services you will write will be of that type, most likely. As you will see soon, there is no need for you to expose ports through node port or to create load balancers. Most of the time, if not always, all, all, all your services should be accessible only from inside the cluster. Now, I know that might sound confusing and I will explain why in a moment, right after we apply the cluster IP service. We will use an ingress controller that will do all the work required for requests to reach our services. Now, unlike services themselves, ingress is not available in Kubernetes out of the box. Ingress specification is there, but Kubernetes does not come with an implementation of that spec. We need to pick one out of many. It could be Nginx Ingress or Contour or Kong or any other. There are many, many, and it would take I don't know, too much time to go through the pros and cons of all of them. Instead, we will just install one I picked and that one is traffic. The installation is simple with Helm upgrade install, name, repo, namespace, and that's it. Now let's wait until it's finished and there we go. Now let's take a look at the services in the traffic namespace. Traffic created a load balancer service exposing internal port 80 for HTTP and 443 for HTTPS. Those ports were exposed on nodes as random ports. And that is okay, since as we already saw, the external load balancer will automatically map to those. Normally we would take the external IP and map DNSs of our domains to that IP. We will not do that today, if for no other reason than because I do not have a spare unused domain. We will use something else. I will get to that later. For now, let's take that IP and store it in an environment variable. And that way I can pretend that I'm not an old fart who cannot memorize a few numbers, right? Since Kubernetes only provides a specification, not an implementation of an ingress, we need to know the name of the ingress class, especially since a single cluster might install multiple ingresses. I mean, that rarely makes sense, but that option is there if you choose to go, I don't know, crazy. Anyways, we can see which ingresses are available by outputting ingress classes. And in this case, we can see that, as expected, only traffic is available. Now, let's take a look at an ingress definition. This time, the kind is set to ingress. It has ingress class name set to traffic, since that's the one we're using. The important part is the rules section, which contains a list of, well, rules. In this case, there is only one that says that requests coming from the silly demo, what's or not, subdomain of NipIO should be redirected to the silly demo service on the port 8080. Since for this example, we need the domain and I did not have any at hand, we are using NipIO service, which provides a simulation of sorts of real domains. It forwards any requests coming to it from the IP specified as subdomain. NipIO has nothing to do with Kubernetes or APIs we are exploring. It is just a convenient way to test resources that requires a domain without uh, having a domain to spare. Now, before we see it in action, 
we'll have to change the host to have the auto-generated IP of the external load balancer. That's the one we stored in the environment variable external IP. So we will execute yq command to modify that YAML. And now finally we can apply the ingress resource. The traffic controller should have detected that ingress resource and use the information contained in it eh, to update the configuration of the proxy running inside the cluster. That proxy today is traffic. We the one we installed earlier. Typically, every application that should be accessible from outside the cluster would have its own ingress resource, and each of those resources would configure the proxy with additional rules, how to redirect traffic based on hosts, or some other criteria, whatever the other criteria is. So, let's see whether it works by sending a request to the make-believe domain nipio, and there we go we got the response. Here's what we did and what happened. We have a cluster with cluster IP service that is inaccessible from anywhere but other pods inside the same cluster. That service is associated to a few replicas, a few pods of an application. We installed Traffic, one of many ingress controllers which provides implementation of the ingress specification and acts as a proxy. Among other things, ingress controller created a load balancer service which in turn exposed a few random ports on the nodes, one for HTTP and the other for HTTPS traffic. And it also created and configured external load balancer. Further on, we applied an ingress resource that reconfigured the proxy to forward requests coming from a specific domain to the service itself. From there on, whenever we send a request to that domain, it would reach the external load balancer, which forwards it to the ingress service, which forwards it to the proxy, to the ingress controller, and that's it. No, that's not it. The proxy then evaluates the request, and in our case, if it matches the domain associated with the application, it forwards it to the cluster IP service, which in turn forwards it further to one of the pods associated with it. That's it. That was a long one, but that's how it works. From here on, we can keep adding services associated to pods and ingress resources that will configure ingress proxy so that requests coming to other domains are forwarded to other applications. And here comes an important, very important note. Ready? If you're using ingress today, you can continue using it for a while longer. But if you're just starting, you might skip ingress altogether since its days are numbered. It will be replaced with Gateway API. Kubernetes ingress specification proved to be too limiting. As a result, ingress controllers provided uh, through other projects ended up adding their own capabilities through labels and annotations or not even using ingress spec at all. If I would have to choose a Kubernetes API that proved to be more problematic than any other, ingress would be without doubt my choice. Kubernetes community realized not only that ingress specification is not optimal, not to say bad, but also that we hit the wall that prevents us from improving it to meet Kubernetes user needs. As a result, a completely different, never seen before specification was born. We got Gateway API. Just as Ingress, it is only a specification that other projects should implement. But unlike Ingress, that specification was designed to accommodate most of the needs we have right now as well as to be extensible, making it future-proof. I expect Gateway API to become the default choice in the future, and those starting now, right now, are advised to skip Ingress altogether and jump straight into Gateway API, while those already using Ingress should be transitioning to it slowly. Now, Gateway API is a big subject by itself, which we will not have time to explore in depth in this video. Besides that, I do not like repeating what I already explored in previous videos, so if you're not familiar with it, you might want to watch that one. The link is in the description. Just don't do it now. Don't. Finish this video first, since I am about to give you a very, very quick introduction. Today, I am using Google Kubernetes Engine, which has the option to simply enable Gateway API without the need to install it. Depending on Kubernetes provider or distribution you're using, you might not be so lucky and might need to install it separately. Anyways, if I list all Gateway classes, we can see that four Gateway API classes are available. The major difference between those is in the type of the external load balancer that will be created. Now, unlike Ingress, which is a single resource, 
Gateway API is split into multiple types. First, there is the gateway resource like this one. The gateway resource defines which gateway class we should use and what the protocol and port will be used for, or to be more precise, configured in the external load balancer. So let's apply it and let's output gateways. And just as with ingress, it might take a while until the external load balancer is created and configured so the address is empty and it has not yet been programmed. If you wait for a few moments and output the gateways again, we can see that we got the IP, the address, and that the load balancer has been configured or in gateway API terms programmed. Now, let's store that IP in a variable. We'll need it soon, trust me. So, what we did so far, in a way, is equivalent to installing Ingress controller, but with more flexibility. Next, we will take a look at the route definition. This is similar to defining an Ingress resource. We are instructing it which gateway to use, telling it what the host name is and what the rules are. In this case, there is only a single rule instructing it to forward request to the service silly demo on the port 88. Next, I will change the host to use NipIO with the IP of the external load balancer and apply the manifest. Now, if we output HTTP routes, uh, we can see that it was created. One route was created and that it uses the NipIO as the host. And that's it. From now on, if we send the request to that host, we get the familiar response. Now, there is much much more to Gateway API than what we just saw. It serves the same basic purpose as Ingress while providing quite a few additional capabilities. It is a specification designed to accommodate the needs of different implementations while at the same time it provides much, much more flexibility to end users. What matters is that you should use Gateway API instead of Ingress. That is it. Now you have a basic understanding of Kubernetes service and networking APIs. You should be able to decide which one to use depending on your use cases. Now, as a summary, we always need services which most of the time should be cluster IP types. There are very, very, very few cases when they should be not port or load balancer types. If you need to enable external access to our applications, we should be using Ingress or Gateway API. Ingress is the widely used, yet soon to be deprecated API that will be replaced by Gateway API. Most third-party applications rely on Ingress, while you might want to choose Gateway API for your own applications, for your apps, since you have the freedom to choose. And that means that we might have to use both for a while longer, at least until third-party apps switch to Gateway API. And now I have a question for you. Was this video useful? Would it make sense to continue through other Kubernetes API groups? If it does, which one would you like to see next? Maybe config and storage APIs? How about that? Anything else? I don't know. You tell me. In any case, that, that's what comments are for. Let me know. Thank you for watching. See you in the next one. Cheers.